All right. Well, it's really thanks to the Freedom of Research program in the Papillardo Fellowship that I'm able to continue working on a few projects in neutrino physics, which is my background, and also to work on a project that's new to me, which is what I'll tell you about today. This project is actually new to MIT as of this year, and globally it represents a new way of looking for signals from dark matter. So there's a principle that suggests if a talk is titled with a yes or no question, the answer is always no. <laughs> um, but what I want to suggest is that for this particular question, the answer might be a very valuable yes, and we are making good experimental progress on being able to test that in the next few years. So I'll try to convince you of that by first motivating our goal. So why are we looking for signals of dark matter in, of all things, cosmic ray antideuterons? Uh, where antideuteron means the bound state of an antiproton and an antineutron, and cosmic ray just means coming to us from outer space. And then I'll describe the unique detection mechanism that we've come up with to look for these cosmic ray antideuterons, which involves them forming exotic atoms in a detector uh, that floats on a balloon high above Antarctica with a view much like this. And I'll focus just briefly on one of the major experimental challenges here, and this is what we are leading at MIT. That's the development of large, high-resolution, lithium-drifted silicon detectors, which are the detector that we'll use to observe these antideuteron-containing exotic atoms. So why are we going down this path? Well, I think the general problem of dark matter is probably familiar to all of us. And for good reason. If uh, geologists had been collecting decades of evidence that a large fraction of the landmass of the Earth lay on a continent that we'd never seen, that would be very strange. And we might say that's the situation in cosmology and astrophysics when it comes to dark matter. It would take a very long talk to go through all of the independent and robust lines of evidence behind the hypothesis of dark matter. But we can certainly say that whether we look at the scale of individual galaxies, or we look at much larger scale structure in the universe, uh, whether we look at visible light or the faint microwave afterglow of the Big Bang, all of these observations point in one direction. It's the idea that the matter in the universe is not dominated by the standard model particles that we've discovered so far. But in fact, the matter content is dominated by a new particle that is neutral, and if it interacts with normal matter at all, it does so very, very weakly. Now, from a particle physics standpoint, this is actually kind of welcome. It's, uh, it's almost the opposite of the situation that Robbie famously described after the discovery of the muon. Um, because we know, and uh, Orhan will describe later, that there are many reasons to believe that the standard model is not a satisfying and complete accounting of the fundamental particles and forces. And for almost every theory that would take us beyond the standard model, there is some possible candidate for dark matter. Now, there are groups at MIT, uh, including the one I work in, and of course many groups elsewhere looking at all different dark matter candidates, these and many others. But what I'll focus on is an important subset of those candidates called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And that name suggests the approach that we want to take to trying to probe this class of theories. So WIMPs, as their name suggests, ought to interact just a little bit with standard model particles. And we can symbolize that by a kind of Feynman cartoon like this. And now we have a freedom about where we want to draw the time axis on this diagram. So the most direct way is to draw it going this direction. And that makes this diagram represent the scattering of a dark matter particle off a standard model particle, such as an atomic nucleus. And so a number of experiments look for the signal of a very, very faint nuclear recoil in a very cold, very large detector. 
Another approach to this diagram is to try to collide two standard model particles, such as protons at the LHC, and look for something strange in the products that might be a dark matter particle. Now, both of these approaches have space to continue to explore, um, but there's some parameter space that's difficult for them to access. And if they do find something, that would be such an important observation that we would want to confirm it um, by, by a totally different kind of experiment. And in particular, we would want to see signals of dark matter coming from the sky because in its most basic sense, dark matter is an astrophysical problem. And so that leads to the third approach to this diagram, which is to try to look for dark matter particles to interact with themselves, either annihilate or decay, and produce standard model particles. So these might be any number of different particle varieties. So if we imagine that they're high energy neutrinos, we could look for those particles in the ice cube neutrino telescope at the South Pole. Or if these particles are gamma rays, maybe we'll see them in a gamma ray telescope, such as Fermi. But there's a problem that's common to almost all indirect dark matter detection experiments. And that's that, of course, there are many processes in the universe that produce standard model particles. And we don't always know the exact rate of production or the energy spectrum. And so that means looking for a dark matter signal is looking for something on top of a background that we maybe don't understand. Now, around 2000, it was pointed out that there is a particle for which that problem doesn't exist. And this is the low energy anti-deuteron. So what theorists realize is that there is almost no way to produce anti-deuterons in the universe other than from dark matter annihilations or decay. And so what these theorists said is that if even a few low energy anti-deuterons are discovered, this should be taken seriously as a clue for the existence of, well, they said neutralinos, but we can be more general, massive wimps in the Milky Way. So I want to show you in a little bit more detail why this is true. And it basically comes down to the fact that anti-deuterons are a pretty obscure particle. Uh, we've only seen them in uh, particle beam experiments, and we can only think of one way other than dark matter that they'd be produced in the universe. And that's the process that I show here where uh, what we call a primary cosmic ray, so this is a proton that's kind of free streaming through um, our galaxy, it can hit probably another proton in the interstellar medium, and it can produce an antiproton and an antineutron. Of course, in that case, you can see that in order to conserve all the right quantities here, you'll have to produce a bunch of other particles, and that's gonna take a lot of energy. But the energy spectrum of primary cosmic rays falls very steeply. And so there just aren't a lot of cosmic ray protons that have enough energy um, to, to produce these particles. And then on top of that, it turns out that kinematically in this process, the antiproton and antineutron that you might get tend to only coalesce if both of them have relatively high momentum. So if we're to look at these anti-deuterons, once they make their way from where they're created to a detector near Earth, we can say two things about this, this uh, background population. First of all, um, the absolute number of these particles that we would see would be very low. So I just show the anti-deuteron flux here in some appropriate units. It's, it's extremely suppressed. The other thing that we see is that the spectrum is peaked well above one GeV and energy. Now keep that in mind because I want to show you the other way that we believe that antideuterons might be produced in our galaxy. And that's from dark matter. So what I show here is kind of a long chain going from WIMP annihilation or decay in our uh, galaxy's halo to antideuteron observation on Earth. And I don't really want to focus on all the details of how this works. I just want to point out what's different compared to the previous case. So first of all, we're talking about WIMPs, where the M means massive. So there's plenty of rest mass 
to create anti-protons uh, and anti-neutrons at still a, a pretty low level, but certainly much more than there was in that cosmic ray background case. Also, the kinematics of this annihilation or decay are different from the spallation case. And what that means is that an antiproton and antineutron can actually coalesce at much lower momenta. So let's look at what happens now if we can observe these antideutrons coming to Earth. Well, we still have the same background from before, but now we have a new contribution to the antideutron flux that we should be able to see near Earth. And that's the dark matter contribution. What I want to focus on here is how much higher the flux of antideutrons from a generic dark matter model is below 1 GeV than the background. You can see it's at least two, maybe three orders of magnitude. And that's the key. So here I'm making this a little bit more realistic by replacing that generic uh, WIMP model with three specific kinds of WIMPs. Now, you don't have to focus on the details of these models or masses unless you want to. The point is, these are quite different extensions beyond the standard model. So this is really a very generic uh, property. All of these dark matter models show that same, uh, that same great contribution to the antideuteron flux below 1 GeV. So just to emphasize this a little bit more, if we were able to see antideuterons in this sub GeV range, those antideuterons would be 100 or 1,000 times as likely to be coming from one of these dark matter models as from background. So the natural question is, well, have we looked? Uh, and the answer is sort of yes. The best experiment was a balloon-borne cosmic ray magnetic spectrometer that looked for antideuterons um, but didn't see them. And in fact, antideuterons have never been observed in cosmic rays. So the best we can say from this experiment is, well, um, the flux is somewhat below this limit. But all the interesting model space is below that limit. So what we really want to do now is take another look and see if we can probe more, more deeply into this space. And that's what the general antiparticle spectrometer, uh, or GAPS, will do. GAPS will look here in this yellow box. And so it'll have excellent sensitivity to this wide range of dark matter models, but it's still sitting well, well above the cosmic ray background. All right, so how do we, how do we make this search? Well, it's actually kind of a new approach for particle astrophysics. The traditional way that you would think to look for uh, cosmic ray antiparticles is to take some kind of um, you know, traditional particle physics system with maybe a large magnet, trackers, calorimeters, et cetera, and that's what BEST was. Um, that's what the AMS experiment um, is very successfully doing for higher energy cosmic rays. Um, but we're making use of a very particular thing that happens when antideuterons interact with matter in a detector. So an antideuteron has the charge of an electron, even though it's thousands of times more massive. And actually, when an antideuteron sees a nucleus, it almost always forms an atom-like state, which we call an exotic atom, because it's not actually an electron. So I've kind of illustrated here the fact that the antideuteron occupies a discrete energy level, just like an electron does in a normal atom. These atoms tend to form with the antideuteron in a highly excited state. And so just like an electron in a normal excited atom, uh, the antideuteron can cascade down through the other energy levels that are available to it. And this happens typically through electron emission for a while, but when the antideuteron gets close to the nucleus in these low-lying energy states, it completes these last few transitions by X-ray emission. And these X-rays have very characteristic energies that depend quite precisely on the mass of this antiparticle and the mass of the uh, nucleus and the charge of the system. So what this gives you is kind of an X-ray fingerprint of the exotic atom that you're looking at. 
So we can tell if we're looking at an exotic atom containing an anti-deuteron because we get this sort of X-ray fingerprint in orange, which is quite distinct from the X-ray fingerprint of an anti-proton exotic atom as shown here in gray. And there's one more handle that we get um, in order to uniquely identify anti-deuterons. When the anti-deuteron gets near or inside the nucleus, it will then annihilate, producing some nuclear hadronic annihilation products. And the number of products is proportional roughly to the mass of the antiparticle involved here. So this technique is a little bit like uh, X-ray fluorescence, which we use to identify materials all the time by normal electronic X-ray transitions. Um, but we have to come up with some totally new system in which to do this for cosmic ray antiparticles. And that's what motivates the design of the GAPS detector. So there are basically two subsystems. There's a time of flight system and the heart of the experiment, which is arrays of lithium drifted silicon detectors. So I'll show you here what happens when an anti-deuteron enters this detector. So first, the particle passes through the time of flight uh, system, which is two layers of plastic scintillator panels. And from that, we learn the velocity of the particle. The anti-deuteron then enters the layers of lithium drifted silicon. And it loses energy as it passes through the silicon and eventually stops. The stopping depth tells us something in combination with the velocity about the mass of the particle. But the key is what happens now. The anti-deuteron forms an exotic atom on a silicon nucleus in a detector. And then that exotic atom decays, producing the characteristic x-rays and nuclear annihilation products that I just showed you. And those products are tracked and absorbed and measured by these same lithium drifted silicon detectors. So what you can see here is these detectors are doing a lot of work for this, for this experiment. And, uh, and we are in turn doing a lot of work here at MIT to try to make these detectors and uh, get them ready to go on the final experiment. So why lithium drifted silicon? Um, well, let me go back to this, this diagram of what an event looks like in our detector. And you can see there are some essential features for, um, for the material that we're using here. First of all, we need to be able to identify the x-ray signature with high resolution. And uh, so that makes you think of a semiconductor, a very sensitive ionization detector, uh, maybe like silicon that's used in uh, collider experiments as a tracker. But actually, we want something a little different from the typical silicon tracker because we want to stop heavy particles. So we need to have uh, detectors that are thick to provide stopping power. And there is a type of, uh, of silicon detector that does that. Now, generally, if we want to make um, a semiconductor diode detector really thick, we need to have really pure silicon. And actually, for this geometry, the purity of the silicon needed would be beyond what's commercially available and certainly very expensive. But there's a trick that's been known for a few decades now where you can take kind of off the shelf, not so pure silicon and compensate for the impurities in it by drifting lithium through the silicon lattice. And that leaves you with a piece of silicon that um, electronically behaves like extremely pure intrinsic silicon. So lithium drifted silicon detectors have been made on uh, a small size for a while. This is a detector produced by a commercial partner in Japan. They use it for x-ray fluorescence. And the active area of this is about half a square centimeter. Now for the GAPS experiment, where we're looking for a very rare signal, we need about 10 square meters of instrumented detector. And it's not very practical to take tens of thousands of these little ones, which by the way need to be cryogenically cooled, and put them on a balloon. So what we have to do is, on our own, figure out a way to fulfill this last requirement of large area detectors. And that's what most of our work consists of at this point in the lab of Professor Sherston Perez here at MIT. So we're going from these very small detectors 
uh, through an intermediate size where we've successfully achieved the energy resolution that we need. And now we're expanding to the full size detectors, which will be 10 centimeters in diameter, and there'll be about 1,000 in the full detector array. Um, we're working to develop the, uh, the coding that we need for these detectors, the correct segmentation, test the energy resolution, the timing resolution, uh, test the performance at various temperatures. And you see a little bit of our work here. These are two members of our lab group taking one of these detectors into a vacuum chamber where we can simulate the pressure and temperature conditions of a balloon flight. So within the next six months or so, we will finalize the production scheme for these novel detectors. And in 2018, we will, with uh, the company that we've partnered with, produce about 1,000 of them. At that point at MIT, we will test each one, validate that it's ready um, to go into the final experiment, and we'll assemble the final experiment. And then we'll take it to Antarctica, where the Earth's magnetic field lines uh, curve into uh, the Earth so that anti-deuterons have a chance, if they are around us, of making it into the atmosphere. These are actually pictures of a previous NASA balloon flight. So um, our flight will look similar and will take advantage of the great experience that NASA has here. Our detector will uh, be powered by solar panels. It'll downlink all of the important data in nearly real time via a satellite network. Uh, and then we'll send it up on a helium balloon, kind of like this. Now, this balloon looks sort of large here, but actually when it gets up to the flight altitude, which is over 30 kilometers, it expands to uh, 30 or 40 million cubic feet, so big enough to hold Fenway Park. Um, and that's needed to hold up a few tons of instrumentation. Once the balloon is up, it, uh, it's an unguided flight. It just floats around for uh, hopefully 30 days, so one or two circuits of the continent. And then we will uh, signal for it to cut itself down. It'll parachute gently onto the ice and be picked up by a little plane that goes out to, uh, to retrieve the detector so that hopefully we can use it for uh, future flights, gather additional data over multiple summers. So maybe a, a balloon flight over Antarctica sounds like a lot of trouble, um, but it's really uh, relatively efficient and cheap if you compare it to the alternative, which is putting an experiment like this on a satellite that you have to send up in a rocket. And I also think that Antarctica is, uh, is a particularly evocative setting to be doing this kind of experiment because uh, I said at the outset that dark matter is kind of an undiscovered continent in our universe. And so what more uh, inspiring place could we be to be setting up this you know, kind of bold, sort of, sort of wacky sounding experiment than, uh, than this vast continent that lay undiscovered for, for such a long period of our history and was only mapped very recently by pretty intrepid explorers. But we have a lot to do before we get to Antarctica. And uh, we are hard at work in the entire GAPS collaboration putting all these pieces together for our first flight, which is scheduled in 2019. So hopefully, around then, I'll be able to come back and update you on what we find. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank Jane and Neil for making it possible for me to contribute to this project and, in general, to be part of the MIT physics community. I really can't imagine a better place to be doing my research. Thank you. There's a lot of work being done for this project, and yet you've already gave a statement of how many of the, I guess, the larger ones that have to have to get the multiple meter area to detect this. Mm -hmm. That means there's been already some tests to be, had that been done to give you some indication 
of how much area you need or how many particles you could expect to detect per unit time? Yeah, so we have pretty detailed simulations that go all the way from the dark matter model through the um, production of antideuterons, transporting those antideuterons through the magnetic fields and matter of the galaxy. And then we, we have ideas about how many antideuterons we'll see here. And then we can simulate and how, how many big the detector. would you expect per day or per week or Yeah, well, so in this experiment, we, we hope to see a few in 30 days. Will there be any other types of particles that give you faults or additional readings that you're not anticipating that create so much noise that it'll interfere with the detection of the anti-deuterons? Well, so this type of detector is sensitive to other kinds of cosmic rays. Uh, so protons, which are the most numerous primary cosmic rays of this right altitude will pass through the detector and so we'll see tracks. But that's not particularly useful information. And it's not really a background for us because it doesn't form an exotic atom. Antiprotons do form exotic atoms. And those are actually an interesting, I mean, they're kind of a background. We need to be able to distinguish their x-ray characteristics from uh, the antideuterons. If we can do that, then we can actually use the antiproton population to make measurements, you know, within itself, and that can tell us about cosmic ray propagation in the galaxy, um, and it also has some sensitivity to dark matter models. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> um, you showed a, a projected flux. Is the flux, there's no directional component? You have to do this at the poles. Yeah, that's right. There's no directional component because they're charged particles, so by the time they get to the Earth, they're, they're totally forgotten where they've come from. Rainer Weiss. I have a question too. Uh, I mean, the question and two questions here. One is you're looking for a pro an antiproton and an antineutron together as an antideuteron. Mm -hmm. Now, why doesn't nature make antiprotons and ordinary neutrons? Why, do, why, why did you pick that? That's the first question. I would imagine those would be more popular somehow if they, for some reason, do exist. Is there something that prevents that from existing? That particular mixed up antimatter, matter, Doodle. Right, so I don't know that it exists as a bound state. I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think that it does. You, is there a good reason that you know of? I mean, I, that's the question really I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's yeah. a good question, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions for Rachel? Okay, good luck. Thank we're, you. We're with you, congratulations.